My dear friends in Christ, I have continually on my mind for the past few weeks a verse from sacred scripture, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 12, which states, For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirit of wickedness in the high places. Thinking of this and meditating on this part of scripture, one would be tempted to ask oneself, How then can I have victory? Principalities and powers? We are talking about creatures who are far more powerful than us. Pure spirits. Reverend Haydock, in his commentaries, writes that St. Paul is definitely talking about the fallen angels and the high places he's referring to as the spiritual realm. A realm that we are a part of. For we are composed of body and soul. Far too often we are concerned with the things that are material and not the things that are spiritual. We are concerned with popular opinion, political correctness, and what our neighbor thinks of us, and we give little time or care to think about what God thinks of us. So this is the battle that we are involved with. No doubt you had meditated upon the, these things in your last talks. But it's a good starting point. So if we're talking about our battle against the principalities and powers, against these creatures that are beyond our ability, but part of the realm that we are part of, that spiritual realm, then let's study them for a moment. We go back to the time of the test of the angels. What was this test about? The test, we are not privy to the exact test. Commentators and holy writers have expounded on what this test was about. The test had something to do with God becoming not an angel but a man. And that a woman, not an angel, would be queen of heaven and earth, queen of angels and men. When I was in the seminary, we learned as part of our morning prayers, and now every morning, we say those blessed words that we prayed here before this talk, the Magnificat, the words of our Blessed Mother, when Elizabeth praised her, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And that great act took place of the sanctification of St. John the Baptist in his mother's womb through our Blessed Mother from our Lord who was in her womb. But before we said it in the seminary, I prayed the Magnificat, we took a verse from the Canticle of Canticles, chapter 6, verse 9. And it's in the form of a question. That question was, or is, who is she 
that cometh forth as a morning rising, fair as a moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array. Holy Mother of the Church takes these words from, old, from the Old Testament and points to our Blessed Mother. Who is she? In the last interview of Sister Lucia in 1957, after lamenting how so few people are taking our Blessed Mother's message seriously. Having said, Father, to Father Augustine Fuentes, who did the interview, the Blessed Virgin is very sad because no one has paid attention to her message, neither the good nor the bad. The good because they continue on the road of goodness, but without paying mind to this message, The bad because of their sins do not see God's chastisement already falling on them presently. They also continue in their path of badness, ignoring the message. But Father, you must believe me that God is going to punish the world and chastise it in a tremendous way. And then she talks about this decisive battle with the devil. The battle that I think, I don't doubt, that we are in the midst of. Father, the devil is fighting a decisive battle against the virgin. And as you know, what most offends God and what will gain him the greatest number of souls in the shortest time is to gain the souls consecrated to God For this also leaves unprotected the field of the laity, and the devil can more easily seize them. Also, Father, tell them that my cousin Francisco and Jacinta made sacrifices because they always saw the Blessed Virgin very sad in all her apparitions. She never smiled at us. This anguish that we saw in her caused by the offenses to God and the chastisements that threatened sinners penetrated our souls. And being children, we did not know what measure to devise except to pray and to make sacrifice. This is the battle that we're in. A warning from our Blessed Mother. We've already highlighted, and we can point to all the things that are the problems with the world and in the church. But I think that it's more important for us to take a look at ourselves and to see what we are doing or not doing where our concerns our devotion to our Blessed Mother. If we are to have a true devotion to our Blessed Mother, we must study and we must meditate on who she is, who she is to us. Listen to her message and warnings and be true devotees from the depths of our heart. Not saying the rosary, praying the rosary. Not saying the Hail Marys, praying the Hail Marys with fervor. This takes faith. Considering her to be our mother. Far too often, I see, as a priest, a lack of faith in the people who proclaim faith. 
Oh, there's absolutely a void of faith in the world, no doubt. But even those that walk into God's house and genuflect, they're more concerned about their neighbor and less concerned about, the, about he to whom they genuflect in front of. People receive communion, and yet with the same lips, they go out and spew on charity. This is part of the problem. And as we look at ourselves, we can't do this. As I was preparing this talk, I was brought to the book of Ecclesiastes. And many feasts of our Blessed Mother, these chapters are parts of these chapters, are presented to us for our meditation. And having read over them, I think it would be good for us to meditate on the meaning that we find in chapter 24, which many of the verses for her feast come from. Chapter 24, verse 1 through 4, it talks about wisdom shall praise her own self And shall be honored in God, and shall glory in the midst of her people, and shall open her mouth in the churches of the Most High, and shall glorify her in the sight of his power. And in the midst of her people, her own people, she shall be exalted, and shall be admired in the holy assembly. And in the multitudes of the elect, she shall have praise. And among the blessed, she shall be blessed. Isn't this the honor that the church promotes us to have towards our blessed mother? Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Words taken from scripture. We continue, I came out of the mouth of the Most High, the firstborn before all creatures. I made that in the heavens there should rise light that never faileth, and as a cloud I covered all the earth. I dwelt in the highest places, and my throne is in a pillar of a cloud. I alone have compassed the circuit of heaven and have penetrated into the bottom of the deep and have walked in the waves of the sea. I believe this points to our blessed mother way back, the first book that we find in the Bible, Genesis, where it talks about very first chapter, second verse, Before the creation, before God said the first fiat, fiat lux, let there be light, it says, and the Spirit of God moved over the waters. Before creation. The translation, you can definitely find the name Mary in there, Maris, C. It's important that we connect the dots. Going back to this this test of the angels, 
The holy commentators say that that test definitely had to be about our Blessed Mother. And for their proof, they point to the conversation that our Lord, or that God had with Adam and Eve and the devil after the fall. But before this, they give it as the reason why the devil tempted Eve. They thought Eve was the one picked to be the queen of heaven and earth. But after the fall, God says to the devil, to Satan, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. In other translations, it says, Between thy seed and her seed, he shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for his heel. It doesn't matter. Both translations are correct, especially when you go to the original, and you can have either or. As if divine providence is telling us right there in the very outset, you can't have one without the other. You can't be a lover of Christ and have no place for Mary. You can't be a devotee of our Blessed Mother and not grow in your love for Christ. It's an impossibility as wetness is to water. We go back to the book of Ecclesiasticus. I have stood in all the earth and in every people and in every nation I have had the chief rule. And by my power I have trodden under my feet the hearts of all the high and low. And in all these I sought rest and I shall abide in the inheritance of the Lord. If that's not referring to that battle, the high and low places. Remember we read about that or we, uh, when we read the Ephesians, the spirits of wickedness in the high places and in the low places. She's victorious. Why? Because he said so. That's what faith is. I believe it because he said so. Do I understand it all? No, I don't need to. All I need to do is believe it because he said so. Remember when he marveled at the centurion? We're reminded of this or should be reminded of this every time we go to mass. And we say the words of the centurion as the priest's. Before we receive Holy Communion, Domine non sum dignus, ut interes subtectum Lord, I am not worthy. Thou shalt come under my roof. Say only the word, and my soul shall be healed. Of course, the centurion said, My servant shall be healed. And it says, Our Lord marveled at his faith. He said, I have not found such faith in all of Israel. That's where it comes down to our faith. What's the measure of our faith? Holy Scripture says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. I truly believe that it's important for us here today to examine ourselves to see if we have a true devotion to our Blessed Mother. And to see, perhaps, if it's lacking on account of 
something that we're doing or not doing, and to make changes. For now is the time. Continue reading from the book of Ecclesiasticus. Then the creator of all things commanded and said to me, And he that made me rested in my tabernacle. And he said to me, Let thy dwelling be in Jacob and thy inheritance in Israel, and take root in my elect. From the beginning and before the world was I created, and unto the world to come I shall not cease to be. And in the holy dwelling place I have ministered before him. And so was I established in Sion, and in the holy city likewise I I rested. And my power was in Jerusalem. And I took root in an honorable people, and in the portion of my God his inheritance and my abode is in the full assembly of saints. Here, Holy Scripture is identifying the mother of the Messiah, underlining that she is the mother of God, and he that made me rested in my tabernacle. And that she is our mother, too. Those who have been baptized and made children of God, as Holy Scripture in the New Testament, the writers of the epistles often point to the churches and to the faithful of the churches as saints. You ever notice when you pray the divine praises at benediction? The very last invocation. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. That means you and I. We're included in his angels, those who remain faithful, and in his saints. The saints in heaven, the saints in purgatory, and the saints on earth. The saints already, the saints soon to be. Fulfilled, and us, the saints, potential. We say the saints actual, the saints eventual, and the saints potential. We are, we are a part of that. That's what you call the mystical body of Christ, the church. I was exalted like a cedar, in Lebanus and the Cypress tree on, the, on Mount Sion. I gave a sweet smell like cinnamon and aromantical balm and yielded a sweet odor like the best myrrh. Interesting. It goes on and it talks about different trees and Beautiful smells. We use a lot of them at Mass in our incense. It even talks about frankincense here. And I couldn't help when reading this to, to think of the prayer that we pray at the end of Mass, the Hail Holy Queen, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. She is absolutely our sweetness. Without her, in this day and age, we have no hope. And we have no hope, you have despair, you have darkness. It's easy to get discouraged in this world, especially when you're face to face, looking at yourself in the mirror and looking at weakness personified. But the fact of the matter is this we don't have to be by ourselves. We have been given. So much, we just have to take ownership of it properly and make good use. Remember the parable 
what Christ was talking about, the kingdom of heaven. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. The ones he gave five and two to, they went and did something with those talents. Gained five more and two more. But the one with one went and wrapped it in a napkin and hid it. And he was the one that was called a wicked servant because he didn't make good use of the gift given to him. We have been given a gift. Christ gives himself to us as the utmost gift. And second, from the cross, he gives to us his mother to be our mother. There's a song the nuns sing entitled, I'm I'm Mary's Child Forever. And in it, it talks about angels. You call her queen, but we, we call her mother. If you haven't read the book, Glories of Mary, I encourage you to. Bishop encouraged us yesterday. The examples alone in these in this uh, book will foster in your heart of hearts a great hope and will stir up in you a devotion to our Blessed Mother. Here is one of the examples. The history of Theophilus, written by Eutrician, Patriarch of Constantinople, who was an eyewitness of the fact he relates, is well known. It is attested by St. Peter Damon, St. Bernard, St. Bonaventure, St. Antonine, and by other quotes of Father Crasset. Theophilus was archdeacon of the church of Adana, a city of Sicily. And he was held with such veneration by the people that they wished to have him for their bishop. But he, out of humility, refused the dignity. It happened that evil disposed persons accused him falsely of some crime. And for this, he was deposed from his archdeaconry. He took this so much to heart that, blinded by passion, he went to a Jewish magician and made him consult Satan that he might help him in his misfortune. The devil told him that if he desired to be helped by him, he must renounce Jesus and his mother Mary and consign him the act of renunciation written in his own hand. Theophilus immediately complied with the demand. The next day, the bishop, having discovered that he had been deceived, asked the archdeacon's pardon and restored him to office. No sooner was this accomplished than his conscience was torn with remorse, and he could do nothing but weep. What could he do? He went to a church and there, casting himself in all tears at the feet of the image of Mary, he thus addressed her. O Mother of God, I will not despair as long as I can have access to thee, who art the compassionate and has helped the power and, and has the power to help me. He remained thus weeping and praying to Our Lady, to Our Blessed Mother, for forty days. When, lo, one night the Mother of Mercy appeared to him and said, O Theophilus, what hast thou done? Thou hast renounced my friendship and that of my son. And for whom? For his and my enemy? O lady, answered Theophilus, thou must pardon me and obtain my forgiveness from thy son. Mary, seeing his confidence, replied, Be of good heart, I will intercede for thee with God. 
Theophilus, encouraged by these consoling words, redoubled his tears, mortifications, and prayers, and never left the image. At last, Mary again appeared to him, and with a cheerful countenance said, Theophilus, be of good heart. I have presented thy tears and prayers to God, and he has accepted them, and has already pardoned thee. But from this day forward, be grateful to him and faithful. But, O lady, said Theophilus, that is not yet enough to satisfy me entirely. The enemy still possesses that impious writing in which I renounce thee and thy son. Thou canst oblige him to surrender it. Three days afterwards, Theophilus awoke in the night and found the writing on his chest, resting. On the following day, he went to the church where the bishop was, and in the presence of the immense concourse of people, cast himself at his feet and with bitter tears related all that had taken place, and delivered into his hands the infamous writing. The bishop committed it to the flames in the presence of all the people, who did nothing but weep for joy and praise the goodness of God and the mercy of Mary shown towards this poor sinner. But he, Theophilus, returning to the church of our Blessed Lady, remained there three days and then died, his heart filled with joy and returning thanks to Jesus and to his Most Holy Mother. somebody who, having sold their soul to the devil, can find recourse in our Blessed Mother, can't we? I say most assuredly we can. Returning to the book of Ecclesiasticus, Verse 24, I am the mother of fair love, and of fear, and of knowledge, and of holy hope. In me is all grace of the way and of the truth. In me is all hope of life and of virtue. Come over to me, all ye that desire me, and be filled with my fruits. For my spirit is sweet above honey, and my inheritance above honey and the honeycomb. My memory is unto everlasting generations. And this, of course, you can draw a direct correlation with the Magnificat, which she utters, From henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Come over to me all that desire me. It comes down to choice. It's our choice to make his mother our mother. He is already offered and she is most willing. We? We cannot give her lip service. Too many have. We have to listen to our mother and follow her instructions like good children do with their mothers. We have to honor her. I cannot believe how many Catholics make poor excuses not to wear the scapular. This sacramental given by our Blessed Mother to St. Simon Stock with the promise that he who dies wearing this shall not suffer eternal fire. How is it that we make such poor excuses and sacrifice being able to partake in such a great promise? Going back to the book of Ecclesiasticus,
And by the way, this book was written by Solomon. When Solomon was made king, God asked him what he wanted, and he asked for wisdom. Now, if you read the account of King Solomon's life, there are many amazing things. But the most amazing thing to me is this man who was so wise, made so many mistakes. It was because of him the division took place in Israel or in the chosen people. Because he made false places of worship for his wives. His, and he married pagan wives in order so that he could have power and where it concerned his state and his country. But I have hope for Solomon. And you know why I have hope for Solomon? Because Solomon, before Solomon even knew was spreading devotion to our Blessed Mother. He writes, They who eat me shall yet hunger, and they who drink me shall yet thirst. He that hearkens to me shall not be confounded, and they that work by me shall not sin. And they that explain me shall have life everlasting. All these things are the book of life. While we're talking about our blessed mother pointing to the words that Solomon wrote, so yeah, I have hope for him, a lot of hope for him. But what about us? They that eat me shall yet hunger, and they that drink me shall yet thirst. You know what true devotion to a blessed mother consists of? Is going to Jesus through Mary. That's why when we have a devotion, we foster devotion, we build our devotion to our Blessed Mother, we're not satisfied. We'll never be satisfied as long as there is an eternity. Because it is the beginning of the fulfillment of the soul. The soul was created to abide one with God and to be forever immersed in the goodness and the grace, and the love of God. Every moment that we are in eternity, when we make it to heaven, will be fulfilled with a new fulfillment. But this life that we have is our test. Like the angels had their test. The angels' test was just in a moment. Because they were made with such intelligence. They had to make a decision, and that decision was final. Because of the gifts given to them. We, having a fallen, or we made a body and soul, are confounded, limited, on account of our medical, our metaphysical makeup. Yes, we have a soul. And because of the fall of Adam and Eve, we have a fallen human nature. But you and I, we are alive. And we have a test that we are taking. And we have to pass that test. It's a test we take each and every day. And the test is a very simple test. It's the same test each day. And that test is be found in the words of our Lord to St. Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me? It's easy to say yes. 
But our Lord tells us, Not he who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven will enter the kingdom of heaven. He tells us what it takes to be true disciples. You have to deny yourself, you have to take up your cross, you have to follow Christ. But for us, that's that's difficult. Unless we do it the right way. And doing it the right way means we become selfless and we shed selfishness. We go beyond ourselves. Our focus is on Christ. And sometimes perhaps because of our inadequacies and the blurred vision that we have because of the neon lights of the world or the tricks and traps of the devil or because of our fallen human nature and the weakness of our flesh. We're wondering if we're going the right way and all we have to do is call out to our Blessed Mother. Never was it known that anyone who fled to her for protection implored her help or sought her intercession was left unaided. Never. He who hearkens to me shall not be confounded, and they who work by me shall not sin. Are you battling temptation? Are you battling weakness? Do you find yourself falling often? Check your devotion to our Blessed Mother. If you really want to overcome weakness, have true devotion to our Blessed Mother. You will overcome that weakness, and you will grow in your love for God. This is what St. Louis M. de Montfort is, calls the secret of devotion to, Mary, of devotion to Mary. St. Louis M. de Montfort, he uses the word secret a lot. You ever notice that? It's a secret because so many people don't know it. They might hear it. but it goes in one ear and out the other, and they don't pay attention to this secret. This is where we point to the secret of the rosary. St. Louis Montfort wrote this book, The Secret of the Rosary. If you haven't read this book, you should. It's a book of hope. It will make you start to love the rosary. I only say start because once you keep praying the rosary, you'll just love it more and more. Understand that it's a weapon against evil. In this book, St. Louis Marie Montfort writes, Blessed Ellen de la Roche, who was so deeply devoted to the Blessed Virgin, had many revelations from her, and we know that And we know that be confirmed the truth of these revelations by a solemn oath. Three of them stand out with special emphasis. The first, that if people fail to say the Hail Mary, the angelic salutation which has saved the world, out of carelessness or because because they are lukewarm, or because they hate it, this is a sign that they will probably and indeed shortly be condemned to eternal punishment. That's just the Hail Mary. Second truth is that those who love this divine salutation bear the the very special stamp of predestination. How can he say that? Predestination? You mean you're already saved? You can't have a devotion to our Blessed Mother and not get to heaven. If your devotion is true, then you have a true love for God and a true love for her her Son, our Lord. And if you love God, you cannot go to hell, for the love of God does not exist in hell. Cannot. And if you love God, you hate sin. 
and you strive with all your power to get closer to him. The third, he continues, is that those to whom God has given the single grace of loving Our Lady and of serving her out of love must take very great care to continue to love and serve her until the time when she shall have had them placed in heaven by her divine Son in the degree of glory which they have earned. St. Louis continues, The heretics, all of whom are children of the devil and clearly bear the sign of God's reprobation, have a horror of the Hail Mary. They still say they are Father, but never the Hail Mary. They would rather wear a poisonous snake around their necks than wear the scapular or carry a rosary. Among Catholics, those who bear the mark of God's reprobation think but little of the rosary, whether that of five or fifteen decades. They either fail to say it or only say it very quickly and in a lukewarm manner. Even if I did not believe that which had been revealed or has been revealed to Blessed Ellen de la Roche, even then my own experience would be enough to convince me of this terrible but, cons- but consoling truth. I do not know, nor do I see clearly, how it can be that a devotion which seems to be so small can be the infallible sign of eternal salvation, and how its absence can be the sign of God's eternal displeasure. Nevertheless, Nothing could possibly be more true. In our own day, we see that people who hold new doctrine and have condemned, that have been condemned by Holy Mother of the Church, may have quite a bit of surface piety, but they scorn the rosary and often dissuade their acquaintances from saying it by destroying their love of it and their faith in it. In doing this, they make elaborate excuses which are plausible in the eyes of the world. They are very careful not to condemn the rosary and scapular as the Calvinists do. But the way they set about attacking them is all the more deadly because it is more cunning. It is the more cunning. Do you ever wonder why they added another five decades to the rosary? It's an attack on the rosary. Illuminous mysteries by the one who is illuminated, the one who bears the light, the one who the Freemasons and Masons honor in their false belief of a dualistic theology the one who bears the light, the light bearer, Lucifer. Yeah, Satan worshippers. Of course, we can see. A blessed mother, if she wanted to give 20 decades, would have given 20 decades to St. Dominic. She gave 15. Stay away from the luminous mysteries. It's a mockery. And deceitful. And we conclude our meditation on this 24th chapter, or 24th chapter of the book of Ecclesiasticus with verse 46. Let's do 45. I'm sorry, verse 44. For I make doctrine to shine forth to all as the morning light. I will declare it afar off. I will penetrate to all the lower parts of the earth and will behold all that sleep and will enlighten all that hope in the Lord. I will pour, I will yet pour out doctrine as prophecy. 
and will leave it to them that seek wisdom and will not cease to instruct their offspring even to the holy age. See ye that I have not labored for myself only, but for all that seek out the truth. Remember what Christ said? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here, Holy Scripture speaks of our Blessed Mother as I have labored for all that seek out the truth. That's our job, our duty in life is to seek the truth and to abide with the truth. It's a very difficult thing in this day and age because of so so many errors that are around. We have been warned by the popes. Pope St. Pius X talked about modernism as a synthesis of all heresies, of all errors. This goulash of errors put out there so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Will we be deceived? High percentage that we will be if we don't have devotion to our Blessed Mother. Little or no chance that we will be if our devotion to our Blessed Mother is true. In the preface of this book, The Secret of the Rosary, when talking about the picture of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the front, it's a part that I read through and thought would be interesting to share with you in this talk. Our Lord appearing to a Franciscan, a humble Franciscan tertiary by the name of Berth Petit. Says, teach souls to love the heart of my mother, pierced by the very sorrow which pierced mine. The heart of my mother has the right to be called sorrowful, and I wish this title placed before that of Immaculate, because she has won it for herself. The church has defined, in the case of my mother, what I myself has had ordained, her Immaculate Conception. This right which my mother has to a title of justice is now, according to my express wish, to be known and universally accepted. She has earned it by her identification with sorrow, by her suffering, by her sacrifices, her immolation in Calvary endured in perfect correspondence with my grace for the salvation of mankind. It is... Hearts that must be changed. This will be accomplished only by the devotion proclaimed, explained, preached, and recommended everywhere. Recourse to my mother under the title, I wish for her universally, is the last help I shall give before the end of time. The words of Lucia, where... She was explaining what the message of Fatima was, what Our Lady asked. She said, Our Lady said, My son wishes devotion to my Immaculate Heart. That's why that prayer, 
Most sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. So powerful. You find it on the green scapular. Has wrought many a conversion. Another of the small gifts, but powerful gifts that our Blessed Mother has given to us. If you have loved ones who are going down a dark path and you want to give them help for their conversion, for their turning towards God, go to our Blessed Mother and make use of the weapons she has given. Yes, pray the rosary for them. You have the miraculous medal. It's called miraculous because of the many miracles that have been wrought. Wear the scapular yourself faithfully as the devotee of our Blessed Mother. Pray to her with confidence and with faith. And make it a gift to those you care about. The green scapular, whether it's a direct or indirect gift. What do I mean by indirect gift? Well, I'll tell you a story. I think I've said this story before. There was a neighbor whose name was Virginia that we had in our home in Colorado Springs. My my mom and dad had bought a new house and we were moving in. We needed one bigger for the children and to help accommodate the needs of my handicapped sister who has died. Um, the year I graduated and has been in heaven since. But as they were moving in, the next door neighbor, she was Henri. And you know how they say they, someone can curse like a sailor? I think sailors would blush if they had heard Virginia. Anyways, as we were moving in, she was having someone set up a fence, a huge fence. Don't you dare come into the yard. And my mom told us, let's stay away from there. And so we're throwing the ball in the backyard, and a ball goes over, like, oh, no. And so we would have to go sneak into the yard to get the ball. And she would come out and shower us with profanities and not nice things. And it so happened, as I told you, I had a handicapped sister who was often very sick and had to be taken to the hospital. There are seven of us in the family. I was away at boarding school during this incident, but my youngest sister was at home, Angela, who is now a mother. But... She was a little, tiny, I don't know, one and a half, two years old. Maybe older. And my mom, an emergency took place. My my sister, my handicapped sister, Marquita, would have seizures and get really sick. And if she didn't go to the hospital really quickly, they couldn't give the medicine in order to get her stable again. And so my mom would have to rush over there. And to find a babysitter in short notice, there was a few people set up, but this day that this took place, those who had been relied on before were not to be had as they weren't available. Last recourse, my mom went with my little sister in hand and tears in her eyes to the next door neighbor. Knocked on the door. What the? She saw my mom's tears and looked at her and, what, 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 what's wrong? And my mom explained the situation. said, I need someone to watch Angela. I need someone to watch my young daughter. A 
Little did Angela know she was being used as an instrument. A little, little, little kid. So how long is it going to be? I don't know. My daughter, I need to go to the hospital right now. Okay, fine. Brought the little kid into her house. And when my mom returned, she found that her little daughter had won the heart of this neighbor, Virginia. Oh, anytime you need to, you can bring her over here. Oh, I have other people. I won't hear of it. I'm next door. I can handle it. And but that summer when we got back from boarding school, my mom said, the next door neighbor wants us to come over for dinner. I'm like, what? Virginia? The one I had enhanced my vocabulary in not a good way from throughout <laughs> the years? Yes, she wants us to come over for a pizza dinner. I'm like, oh boy. Hi, this is something else. So I, we walked uh, next door. And it was amazing, the change. That one simple act of charity did. And we learned about Virginia. She was a fallen away Catholic, probably a victim of all the changes in the church, the new order. And probably added to her frustration and her anger. And being up here and being taught by the brothers and the sisters, I remember the sister, Sister Michaela, she was always be telling us about devotions and everything else like that. And she told us about the green scapular. I said, hmm. I'm going to have to put this to the test. And so, one, another thing that has to be said about Virginia was she smoked like a stove. And so the house was inundated. It was just filthy. But my mom, in order to help her out, who helped her out in her need, offered to clean for her, and which was my way in I saw my mom would be doing all the cleaning and so I was able to give indirectly a gift to Virginia of the green scapular I stuck it between the couch I knew it was a scapular conversion did you know that Virginia died having the sacraments and coming back to the church and a priest at her deathbed. And I am for sure convinced that it has everything to do with our Blessed Mother. Let's make good use of the gifts given to us by our Blessed Mother. Not wear them as superstitious or use them as superstitious little trinkets but to remind us to call upon our blessed mother with devotion and with sincerity with hope I'd like to end today's talk with a prayer I'm going to take it as somebody had arranged it in the form of a song a hymn at church but This can be our prayer. As we started off talking about the ship at sea and Mary being star of the sea. That's the the title of this song. Hail Queen of Heaven, the Ocean Star. One side note of incidents, we have angels like the angels you see here in our church, two up in the front on either side of the altar. And one of the one on the gospel side, I always take great consolation in the angels holding the plaque and on it is in 
representation of our Blessed Mother is a ship at sea and a star, the Ave Maristella. Let us pray to that Queen of Heaven, the star of the sea. Hail, Queen of Heaven, the ocean star, guide of the wanderer here below. Throne on life's surge, we claim thy care. Save us from peril and from woe. Mother of Christ, O star of the sea, pray for the wanderer, pray for me. O gentle, chaste, and spotless maid, we sinners make our prayers through thee. Remind thy son that he has paid the price of our iniquity. Virgin most pure, O star of the sea, pray for the sinner, pray for me. And all to him who reigns above, in Godhead one, in persons three, the source of life, of grace, of love, Homage we pay on bended knee. Do thou, bright queen, O star of the sea, pray for thy children. Pray for me.